Awesome. Oh, Alexis, are you going to make me host? Quick question. Awesome. Well, have a little introduction. I guess we can wait until exactly three o'clock. But awesome. All right. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ebony Johnson. I am the director of the DBFF Institute. And on behalf of the Denny Black Film Festival and the Denny Black Film Festival Institute, my associate uh, director, Agatha Bynes, we're glad you can join us this afternoon um, for this conversation about finding the funds for your film. And we are so happy to continue our summer session with this event and excited to have the amazing lineup of women and this opportunity to gain valuable resources and knowledge from each of these individuals. Um, before we get started though, I wanted to let everyone know that you can interact with us, give us questions. If you have any questions for our guests by commenting on Facebook, and then we'll make sure that we can uh, receive them and read them here um, and give them to our guests. So without further ado, we have our first guest, Erica. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me give you a little bit of introduction. Um, Erica Deparne Sugars is an independent media maker and media arts um, community who works with media arts communities expressing to support diverse voices and stories. Um, she has held senior roles with national media organizations like ITVS, which we would love to hear about your experience with that, Erica, maybe for a little bit, um, and is currently the director of programs for the Austin Film Society, where she oversees filmmaker grants and artist development programs. Um, as well as Austin's public, uh, Austin Public, the community, the city's community media center. Um, Erica has served on grant panels for film jur juries, um, including the ND NEA, IDA, South by Southwest, CAM, are the Center for Asian American Media for the New Orleans Film Festival, Big Sky Film Festival, and so much more. She's amazing resource, amazing woman, and so glad to have you here with us, Erica. Um, and I guess to start off our conversation, I know we have the grant for Texas filmmakers coming up. So can you give us a little bit of information about that? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, and it's great to interact with the community in any way that I can. Um, yeah, so Austin Film Society runs the AFS grant um, and we are in a grant cycle right now. So this grant started in 86, 1986. Um, and ha 96, sorry, and has uh, given over $2 million in cash directly to independent filmmakers, as well as in-kind services and goods, um, and has supported about 400, over 425 filmmakers in Texas. So this is really a Texas-based grant, um, and we are in our cycle right now for feature films. Um, last year, we sort of split up the shorts and the feature cycle so that we could really maximize um, you know, the applications and really look at these things a little bit more apples to apples than we had in the past. But we do fund shorts and features of all types. Um, uh, and it's really for what we would call emerging, emerging filmmakers. Uh, a majority of the funds go to um, new first time filmmakers, um, but some, you know, seasoned filmmakers, mid-career filmmakers who just really need the support to launch a new project or finish you know, they're at a certain point to finish a project and need that influx of, of funds. So um, so it is right now uh, through, I think, I believe June 8th is our deadline. 
Um, and this year uh, we have kind of a new part to this grant. So we have our regular AFS grant for production. So we fund all phases of production, pre-production, production, post-production post and distribution. Um, and again, it's for feature films. So we kind of designate that as uh, 40 minutes or above um, in any genre. Um, and it you can um, request up to $15,000 in cash. And we have a couple of in-kind um, services as well. Um, so that's kind of what people know is the AFS grant. Um, and then we have a special grant this year that we launched given, you know, this, uh, the pandemic and the sort of fallout and the effects that filmmakers and pennant filmmakers are feeling about the loss of production, the um, uncertainty of projects right now. Um, we have launched a, a development grant, uh, which is a new grant for this year uh, with a separate application. And it is for $5,000 in support for a filmmaker to develop a project, a uh, feature length project that can either be um, documentary, animated, narrative. Um, and those funds are really just used for whatever part of development um, you need uh, to get off the ground. And part of it is you know, us trying to get more dollars into the hands of independent filmmakers in Texas, uh, but also know that um, we, you know, we don't know what the effects of this pandemic will be in the future for the future pipeline at independent filmmaking. So we want to make sure creatives are still able to work and create new projects. Awesome. And then the stipulation is you have to be a Texas resident, correct? Correct. So this is for any Texas resident. You just have to have a proof of Texas residency. Um, we ask that you are a Texas resident of at least a year. So about June of last year, you should have uh, been a Texas resident. Um, you do not have to be a US citizen. So that is something to note here. There's no citizenship requirement. You just have to be a Texas resident. Um, and then um, on our website, it kind of details what we need um, to, to verify that um, residency. But outside of that, it's you can be from any part of Texas. Got you. Awesome. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. So do you have any tips for filmmakers like when writing their grants? Is there something that reviewers look for that make a grant stand out in a positive or a negative way? Sure. I mean, I think um, we get this qu question all the time, particularly for our grant. And I think um, all grants are not equal. All grants are looking for, grantors are looking for something different. So that's something you should know. I know that there has been a movement, particularly within the documentary film community for uh, what they call the common, the core application. So that they're asking similar parts. So you don't have to kind of refurbish your, um, your documentary, particularly your documentary proposal each time, but really do your due diligence about understanding what the grant is supporting. We um, at AFS don't have any specific subject requirements or any, um, you know, we're not looking for any type of story or any type of filmmaker. It really is open. But what we are looking for is your, um, your artistry, right? Like what about this film really speaks to you as an artist and is an expression of you as an artist? And that's what our panelists and our reviewers are looking for. Um, also, we talk about career leaps a lot. Um, we have a lot of kind of emerging and mid-career filmmakers in Texas. And, and what we want to see is that the support that we're giving through this AF grant, AFS grant is kind of helping you get to the next point in the career that you want and that you're going for. So whether it's emerging or maybe you're uh, going from short to feature, or maybe you're trying to, to expand um, your genre. I mean, we're, that's one of the things we're looking for is how the money um, can really bolster you as an artist and take you to the next step. Yeah, yeah, got you. I guess feeding into that, um, one of my big insecurities applying for grants is that I lack any like major accreditation. I don't have a film that's been in South by Southwest. Or I don't have a lot of laurels or anything like that. So is there a way to kind of strengthen my application? Should I like be mindful when I build like my production team? Is that gonna make me a, a little bit more attractive, I guess, to grantors? 
Yes, again, it depends on the grant, but if you're, particularly if you're an emerging artist, I think it's true. Who do you have around you that can show success? Because when people want to give money, um, there's a risk, right? And you want to make sure that this person completes um, their film at some point in time. And um, so knowing who you have to surround you, who do you have who has um, the abilities to, if you're the director and applicant, to um, successfully create your vision who are those people around you, whether it's the producers or the DPs, um, and they can also be very emerging as long as you can demonstrate that they have a vision and that they can execute what you want them to execute. So, you know, for us, particularly with our grant, you know, even if you your film didn't go somewhere um, and you but you completed a film, you should absolutely send that in as a, uh, you know, part of your application as a supporting material or a link so that we can see that you have the experience um, and that we can see a little bit about your cre your creativity. Um, but yes, it is important to kind of think about who you surround yourself with. And then also how much knowledge do you have if you wanna create a really great animation um, or yeah, a, a very particular type of animation that you know that you've been exploring other animated films that you have some comps in mind that you know where yours might sit in the canon of those types of films. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do have a, a viewer question um, from Sean. So if a subject of your film um, is a Texan, can you apply for the grant? I guess the filmmaker is not from Texas. Yeah. Right, so the AFS grant is for um, directors uh, and main creatives that, who live in Texas. So no, if you don't live in Texas, you can't apply for the funds, but if you have a co-director who um, is also part of the creative team, they can apply for this project. Um, and then, you know, the converse to that is, if you get the AFS grant, your film does not have to be shot in Texas or set in Texas or anything like that. It can be anywhere in the world you wanna shoot it. It just, for us, it's really important to support um, Texas makers and make them, you know, sustainable, build the sustainability and that they can live and work here. That's our, that's what's important to us. Yeah, yeah. We have another question from Ken and he asked, are there certain genres that typically receive or don't receive grants? Uh, no, we have it across the board. We have a lot of genre films. We have a lot of um, animation, you know, there's not, not anything in particular. I think, you know, again, outside of AFS grant, look at the grantors that you're um, going after and m make sure that you get that question answered because some people may only be funding documentaries or some people may only be show uh, funding animation or maybe narratives, but not animation. Um, for us, we are open. I do think it's harder sometimes for um, narrative films to get funded um, by jurors and um, evaluators because, you know, most likely they don't have anything to see, right? So films like documentaries may have some research footage, may have early um, early shoots, and they can put something together early. Um, I find that it's harder sometimes for narrative filmmakers to get early support, um, and then that's really when the onus is on you to, you know, put the make sure your writing's really good and solid and that you have really good plans of production and then give us as much visual comp, lookbook, whatever that can help us get an idea of how you're gonna create um, the film visually because in the absence of, you know, some visual material. Got you, got you. And there's for people on Facebook, please give us a thumbs up if the information that we're getting, the answers we're getting is helpful for you guys. Um, and then, Erica, I'm remembering I was trying to apply for a funding last <laughs> last year, and I remember there was a part um, for you to to upload a script. I guess is that still for this application as well as part of like your vision for the project? Yeah. So you are required to. You have, there's an application, and there are a number of attachments, and one of the attachments is either a treatment or a script. If you have a narrative film and you have a script, even if it's an early script, but if it's a complete script, we would prefer you to send that. Um, it really does help in the evaluation process for people to understand the story from the beginning to end. It's not a screenplay competition, so no one's gonna you know, critique the writing of the screenplay, um, but it, it's really useful. Um, but it is required either that or a treatment. If you don't you haven't gotten to a script draft yet, a completed script draft, you may just create a treatment, which is just kind of a, 
a, a more extensive version of a play-by-play -play of how this the story is going to unfold. Got you, got you, awesome. Um, and then you were talking about this with the development grant as far as with uh, COVID, but what are you seeing as impacts with COVID on um, nonprofits and foundations and recommendations for filmmakers now looking for funding or looking for funding during this time period? It's kind of very unstable and uncertain, yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of film, the more I've talked to film funders, um, a lot of them are still funding. They're trying to find creative ways to disperse money knowing that production timelines, particularly for narrative films, I mean, even for documentary films, production timelines are gonna be slow and uncertain as we go forward, right? Um, I think when you are applying for grants and they're still out there, you know, I think you have to kind of uh, address the big elephant in the room, which is like, how will you shoot this? How visually will this be executed? Knowing that, you know, the production landscape of independent filmmaking has changed, you know, and it will change outside of a lockdown. Um, and what are you going to do to um, protect yourself, protect your characters, protect your, your crew? Um, those are things that are gonna start showing up in budgets, I imagine, if they haven't already in terms of, uh, and timelines, you know, slowing down your process a bit because you'll, you have to do more prep or you have fewer people on set. Um, so, but I, I, the funding landscape, you know, within a lot of arts, the nonprofit communities like ours, I mean, they, they're suffering as well um, in terms of their resources and having to make some choices around um, organizational sustainability and um, grants to artists. Um, and many of them are committed to continuing to support artists through grants. Um, so a lot of those grants are still there. Um, whether they're gonna be competitive or not is gonna be, you know, remains to be seen. Yeah. Um, as this unfolds, how many of the, how many more people are gonna go to certain grants than others. Um, and right now there's been a lot of relief funding for artists who've been disrupted in different pockets of the community, um, particularly for filmmakers. So you should look for that special opportunities. If you've lost funds or you've lost production, there are a number of small um, grants that some organizations and foundations are starting to put out for the filmmaking community. Gotcha. Awesome. And just to get a little bit more detail about the, the grant you guys are doing, is it in the same application base or is it any different? Right. So it's running on the same cycle. It is a separate application. So you, when you go to our website and all this information can be found on austinfilm.org, um, our website under the filmmaker resources and the grant, the same deadline, you have to submit one or the other. So you cannot submit to both. You um, that's the one requirement, again, to try to get money into the hands of as many filmmakers as we can support at this point. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of questions I've been getting on some of our webinars have been, um, you know, I have this great idea for development, but I have something that was sort of early in production. Um, should I, what should I apply for since you can only apply to one? And um, we're saying that if you already have a project that's started and you, you, it's in production, you know, you're not, currently in production, but it is in production, raise money for that. You have something already, you have things to show, you have a, a plan already. Um, for us, we'd like to see that in the production um, fund and not development. Because one, the development money is a lot smaller than the larger pot of production money that we have. Um, and again, it's almost like if you, we, you, we know that your production schedule may be um, uncertain going forward, but we are taking that into consideration as we're making these decisions. And so it's really us getting in the hands of, of filmmakers so that they're ready for production when they can start again. Um, there's no sort of timeline on those funds in the same way. Um, and development does have a timeline development funds. There's, it's a one year cycle and um, there are some deliverables just to make sure that you know we understand how you use the development funds um, after the year, it's about mm -hmm. a year, so. Um, and again, really meant to, to, to get a project off the ground and start thinking about a project. But if you have a project already that started, even if it's an early production, I think you have a better chance of securing funds through the production grant. Got you. I have another audience question from Carmona. Um, it says, aside from providing visual assets, how would a narrative short 
film projects set itself apart, do marketing materials, work as support for a narrative project? So um, our shorts deadline is gonna happen later in the summer. So we're gonna open that up in July. So this current um, um, deadline is for features, uh, which would be 40 minutes and above, but we do have a shorts deadline. So this question is applicable to that, applicable to that. Um, what sets it apart is um, how your, your project description for sure, besides the um, visual assets, they're gonna ask you for a project description. And it's really about your vision as an artist um, you know, why, why is it important to tell this story? Why are you the person who should be telling this story? How this money is going to really uh, bolster again, your, your career as a filmmaker. Um, and then I think, you know, we ask you for, uh, bios, you know, show us things that you've done before. It's good to see if this, particularly if this is your first short or you haven't done a whole lot. Um, it is good for us to see, um, examples of other work. If you, particularly if you don't have a work in progress of the current project to show. Um, and so that that's important. Letters of support are actually very helpful too. Again, if you're a an emerging artist, this is your first time, people who can vouch for you, people who have been mentoring you or you have worked with, um, it's always helpful for us to see who you're surrounding yourself with. Um, so that's another sort of standout, but it really is sort of the, for us again, going back to the project and why you're the person to tell the, tell the story um, or why is this project really important for you as an artist? I think that's what helps stand, have things stand out for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there is a question from Ken. Uh, would a completed script but not in production um, be considered production or development? I guess trying to figure out which grant to apply for. Yeah, I mean, um, in the development funds, it, uh, if you already have a script, and you decide to apply for it, um, you can with the script. The idea is that you're telling us what you're gonna do is your next phase of development. So if it's an early script, but you really wanna hone in some notes or secure characters or, you know, um, that you can apply for development with a script and it is actually helpful. If you do have a, an early script and you wanna apply for development, you should um, include that. Um, but if you're already starting, you want to apply funds to get into pre-production. So the funds that you would apply for, for the AFS grant for production is really to get stuff situated, casting maybe, or securing locations, all that pre-production work. Um, you can apply for the production fund and use those grants, the grant money towards that. Sure. And obviously if you have a script, it would be really helpful for you to um, include that in the production grant. My application, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then I have a question as far as suggestions regarding if or when filmmakers should contact like a funding agency and what type of questions um, they should ask or avoid asking when doing that type of approach. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a diff, it's a different time now, right? And I think that there are certain foundations that I think people felt more free to go to and ask questions who may not be entertaining um, filmmakers right now, um, mm -hmm. because maybe they've shifted their um, efforts into you know social services or other what they would deem more important um, uh, aid right now, and that's great. I mean, I, I think that's all diff different to the different foundation and funder. Um, but it, this is so. This is a really good time just to reach out and let people know what you're doing, so they don't forget you. Particularly if you already had early conversations with a foundation who might be interested in your film because of a certain subject matter, or it appeals to the constituency that is their main constituency. Uh, there's no harm in reaching out and letting them know that you're still there. But it's really about engagement should be about engagement and less about asking for money in this moment, unless you know they're still, you know, trying to um, give out funds. But I, I think that's not a bad thing. Um, um, and I think similarly with crowdfunding, sort of knowing who your audience is, and you know, I know you'll talk about that later, but um, going out to your constituency to let people know about your project is always a good thing. Yeah. Um, when to ask for money can be an awkward time, right? <laughs> and right now, it, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Um, but the film funders who are still funding, it, I say ask the questions if they have deadlines, you know, go to their websites, get 
the FAQs, if they have, um, a lot of them are now like us um, doing webinars, show up at the webinars, ask a lot of questions, get as much knowledge as you can. Um, and, you know, I would say it's a good time to put your project out there, whether you're going to get funded or not. I always think uh, applying for grants like AFS grant is good practice for grant writing. Um, you can learn a lot from the different pieces that you have to put together if you've ever written a grant before. Um, and I say this as a grant funder from uh, in my other parts of my life, previous experiences, I track projects. You know, if there are projects and talent that I loved but didn't get funded for whatever reason, I would look for them again. I was happy when I would see them surfaced in other grant pools or see it out in the world. So um, I always say it's helpful to put yourself out there and get your project in front of people who are making these decisions because ultimately you'll see them again or they might see you again and yeah. the, the result could be different. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, we have one other um, audience question from today. Today, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced, but uh, how she asked, how about documentary, I guess, and docu series? Um, what would be needed for the application for those types Great. of projects? Good question. Um, our AFS grant for production, we don't um, entertain proposals for series. However, if you were creating a standalone um, project that was meant as part of a series, we would look at it for that. So if it's standalone and you're only applying for that particular episode or that particular, um, yeah, particular episode or pilot, let's say, as long as the funds and the proposal are just for that, if it's meant for a series, great, that's fine. Different though, um, for the development fund, if you are um, creating a series, um, you can apply for the development fund. Um, those funds can be applied to that. So that's a little bit of a, a nuance there, but right now we're just not, we're not in a place that we are looking um, to entertain the production of series. Got you, got you, okay. And I guess as we wrap up, did you have anything, Erica, that you want to promote for Austin Film Society or anything else? Yeah, so the full um, uh, grant details are, like I said, online, austinfilm.org, in our filmmaker resources. Important to kind of go through there. We have download loadable uh, instructions, so it takes a little bit. We've asked to, for a couple of steps, so please do that before the deadline. Um, and like I said, we've been holding a couple of um, Zoom calls, but we have one last one on Wednesday, next Wednesday before the deadline, and it's um, and you can sign up on the website. And it's just really for Q and A. We've been doing more presentations, and actually, our very first Zoom presentation is online for you to look at on our website as well, so you can get the download of all the, the steps. Um, but we will have a, a nice Q and A on Wednesday before the deadline for those last minute questions and concerns, and and hopefully we'll see some of you there. Yay, yay. Thank you yay. so much, Erica. Thank you guys. Yeah. And I hope you apply. I hope we see some new filmmakers. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, I guess we will transition now to, I'll give it to my co-host, Agatha. <laughs> but thank you again, Erica. You're amazing. Thank you. Good to see you all. Good to see Stay you. safe. Thank you, Erica. Um, I really appreciate all that information um, about grants and funding, I know it's something that filmmakers um, that's on their minds. So um, as we transition to our next speaker, uh, welcome. Um, I'm grateful for those who are continuing with us and um, welcome to those who have just joined. My name is Agatha Bynes and I'm assistant director with the Denton Black Film Festival Institute and have the joy of working with Ebony Johnson who is the Institute's director. And as part of our off-season programming, um, we've scheduled this event about how to find funding for your film. So um, I am delighted to be able to introduce Barbara Gamashi, um, our next speaker who joins us from Women Make Movies, which is a nonprofit organization that supports women producers and directors at all stages in the filmmaking process with the hope of diversifying the filmmaking landscape and making it more inclusive. Women Make Movies is also the world's leading director of independent films by and about women. And Barbara is part of their team. She specifically oversees the production assistance program and acquisitions. And this includes fiscal sponsorship, which she'll be talking about today, but also other um, 
offerings. So um, she might be able to speak about that as well. And she also works with um, broadcast and digital sales with Women Make Movies. Um, she has experience as a producer as well and has worked on films that have screened in numerous festivals and um, been broadcast on PBS, the doc documentary channel and Showtime. And we've asked her here today to highlight Women Make Movies fiscal sponsorship program. So um, I just wanna make a note that although Women Make Movies does focus on supporting women filmmakers, um, other organizations also offer fiscal sponsorship. So I imagine this information will be useful to all filmmakers. Um, and please post any questions you have for Barbara um, and we'll get to them, um, as many of them as we can. So Barbara, welcome. Thank you so much, Agatha. Um, I am gonna try to share screen here. Um, so I have, a... no, I cannot share screen. It says the host has disabled that. Um, Let's try one more time. Okay. Okay. Looks like I can. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. So, um, can you see that? Can you see that PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. So, I'm just going to go through this PowerPoint real quick, um, and we will talk about fiscal sponsorship. So as Agatha said, I work for Women Make Movies. I'm the director of Filmmaker Services and you can see my email here. You can also find it on our website if you wanna get in touch with me at any point. I am always happy to answer questions about acquisitions or the production assistance program or anything else about Women Make Movies. So please do get in touch. Um, we have been around for over 45 years and we are a distributor as well as having a production assistance program. Uh, on the distribution side, we um, distribute films by and about women. And the core of what we do in distribution is educational, which means that we work with colleges and universities, nonprofits, um, prisons, hospitals, uh, religious organizations, and any other kind of organization that can use the films in our collection. And we have about 700 titles in our collection. We also have the production assistance program and that provides uh, services to women filmmakers uh, who have projects at any stage of development all the way through outreach and engagement. Unlike distribution, which is films by and about women, the production assistance program uh, are films by women about anything. We also offer discounts to our workshops and webinars. We offer fundraising support, distribution support, um, feedback on um, rough cuts and proposals and work samples. And we really try to tailor our support to the needs of each individual project. So what is fiscal sponsorship? That is the key component to our production assistance program. So we will get into that. So fiscal sponsorship really is a way for um, artists and other organizations that are not nonprofits in and of themselves to access funds that require a nonprofit recipient. So for example, Women Make Movies is a 501c3 organization. So when we act as a fiscal sponsor, we act as that umbrella organization. And that, and that way we can accept funds on behalf of your project. But that also means that we are responsible for making sure that the funds we receive for your project are spent on appropriate production expenses. Um, and different organizations have different ways of doing that. For us, we uh, require um, paperwork that basically says how you plan on spending the money. We then disperse the money. And once a year, we, have, uh, we ask for a report where you tell us how you have actually spent it. So for that service, uh, there is a fee. Our fiscal fee is 6%. It goes down to 4% once cumulative donations reach uh, 350,000. But different fiscal sponsors have different fees. And that's really because there is work involved in the administration of these funds. Um, and some fiscal sponsors uh, do more than others. There are some that will uh, pay your invoices and send out 1099s for you. And those organizations will uh, charge a higher fiscal fee. 
But one thing to keep in mind that's very important is that fee is only charged on money that comes into the fiscal sponsor. That is not a percentage of your entire budget. And, and I would think that this is the case with most organizations, it's certainly the case with us, that once you are accepted into the production assistance program, there is no penalty if you don't raise any funds. You are still entitled to all of the benefits of the program. Um, Every fiscal sponsor uh, will have a different contract. Um, so you should look at that contract obviously before you sign it. Um, and we'll, we'll get to some of the differences in just a minute. Um, this is very important. A fiscal sponsorship, a fiscal sponsor does not have any control over your content. They are not involved creatively. They do not know, own your intellectual property. Um, you may want feedback. Um, we love giving feedback, but that uh, does not mean we have any control over the creative. So here's one of the differences that you'll find in some of the contracts. Some fiscal sponsors allow you to have investors, some don't. We do. Um, there are others that do as well. IDA is another one. Film Independent is another one. And but the idea here is there are very strict rules in place that allow you to do what we call hybrid fundraising. And that means that you're raising money through investments and money through donations. Some of those rules include the filmmaker um, maintaining uh, complete control over their project. That's creative control, financial control. Um, once someone is a donor, they cannot then become an investor and vice versa separate bank accounts for the different pools of money. And we have a long list of guidelines um, to, to allow you to do this. But as I said, some fiscal sponsors don't allow you to do that. So those are some of the differences you'll see in the contracts. Samples of some funders who do require fiscal sponsors. Chicken and Egg is one of them, Cinereach, Catapult. But not every funder does require that. Sundance is a, is a funder that does not require a fiscal sponsor. Okay, so different kinds of funding. Foundations, you know, that's, that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, you know, uh, foundations, again, oftentimes require that 501c3 recipient. So that could require, if that is part of your fundraising plan, you might need a fiscal sponsor. Um, the same with some government grants. Here in New York, we have something called um, New York State Council on the Arts, NISCA. That's a New York State grant for, um, for all art, artistic endeavors. Um, we primarily work with filmmakers. They require a fiscal sponsor. Corporations, many corporations have their, their sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, philanthropic arm that might require that 501c3 recipient. And then individuals. So um, individuals who give to your project, who are looking for a tax deduction, can receive that tax deduction because they are giving to a nonprofit. Um, some uh, crowdfunding campaigns choose to have that money go through a fiscal sponsor. And if it does, then that crowdfunding donation is also tax deductible. However, um, we actually don't recommend it. Um, and this is a whole other conversation, but part of the reason that we don't recommend it is it becomes very expensive for the filmmaker because there is a platform fee, a credit card fee, and um, a fiscal sponsorship fee. So when all is said and done, you might be paying, you know, 10 to 13% on that money that you've worked so hard to raise in your crowdfunding campaign. In addition, remember, if someone is getting a tax deduction, there can be no goods or services exchanged. So if you are offering perks, you have to include the value of those perks on your um, crowdfunding campaign page. And those values will be subtracted from the donation amount to get the actual tax, deduct tax deductible amount. So it's very complicated. Um, so these are some examples of fiscal sponsors. Um, you know, as Agatha said, uh, Women Make Movies supports women filmmakers. So 
um, in order to be eligible for our production assistance program, there needs to be at least a woman co-director. But uh, these are other wonderful um, organizations that have really great fiscal sponsorship programs. Um, IDA, Film Independent, IFP, Fractured Atlas, New York Women in Film and Television, and NIFA, New York Foundation for the Arts. Now I'm gonna see if this works. So I can give you an idea of what our application looks like. And I think it is actually working. So um, let's take a look here. Okay, so you'll see on this first page, um, our check boxes for eligibility. And we did this um, because I think one of the thing that one of the things that I would encourage filmmakers to do when they're thinking about whether to apply to a fiscal sponsorship program is to really think about do they need it? Do they actually need it? For example, if you're primarily going to have investors, you don't need a fiscal sponsor. You're not going to be doing that kind of fundraising. If you are just doing a crowdfunding campaign, um, you probably don't need it because you probably don't need to offer the tax deductibility to the people donating through. Yes. Sorry, Barbara. Um, it looks like the, it, it hasn't translated to the screen, the application. I thought my computer was maybe just slow, but I don't know if there's a way you could go directly to the website. Uh, oh, you know what? Let me see. Are you seeing, are you seeing it happen? Not yet, but I'm far okay. from an expert about this. Okay, that's okay. You know what, we will, let's go back to this. There should, there might be an option where you can share your alternative screen. Hmm, well, you know what? The link is in here. Um, I can also, um, hmm, you can find the application on our website. I think that's probably the best thing to do. And I'll just sort of walk you through it a little bit. So essentially, we have these check boxes that we ask, we ask you to look through before you actually start your application. And again, it's because we want you to really think, do you need a fiscal sponsor? Because not every project is going to need that. So those are some of the things that you're confirming. You're also confirming that you have um, a work sample. Now this is really important because when we look at projects uh, for our program, what we're really looking at among many other things is are they ready to start fundraising? And pretty much every funder, even if you're applying for development is going to need a work sample. Um, so it's really important that you have a work sample before you apply to us because you're going to need it for everybody that you apply to. Um, and then we ask you, have you done your documentary core application? Now the documentary core application is a fantastic tool to sort of synthesize all of the elements of your project into one proposal. And many, many funders use the documentary core application, as do we. So, um, you know, if you uh, want to find it, you can find it on our website. You can find it on many different funding websites. It asks for things like your log line, your treatment, um, your um, the the overarching um, issue of your film. Why you? Why are you the one to tell this story? What is your artistic approach? Okay, so here we go. Tips for fundraising, a strong proposal. This is so important. Think of your proposal as the story of your project. So each, each section of that proposal should feed into the next section. A strong work sample. This is so hard and we know it's hard. Um, but as much as you can to show a, a work sample should really show the scope of your project or your access 
or um, what's unique about uh, your approach to the story. Um, you know, as, as much as you can show what the film is, in of course a five minute sample, um, the better. Ah, yes, scour the credits. So um, this is one thing that we tell all of our filmmakers and it's one of the reasons that access to our distribution catalog is, su is such a great benefit um, from our production assistance program. Because looking at the credits of other films that are like yours will tell you who funds films like yours. Um, so that is a great way uh, to start thinking about your fundraising strategy. Um, relationship building. You know, I, I think that um, that's really important. You know, and, it, and it's hard to know where to begin. And, and we certainly know that. I think one way to begin is to literally start applying for the grants that seem right for your project. And even if you don't get the grant, and, and I just wanna say that many of our filmmakers um, who, have, who have made other films, it still takes them two or three times of applying to get certain grants. Um, and I think that the more funders uh, see your project, see it evolving, um, the more interested they're going to be. So one way to develop those relationships, like I said, is start applying. Another way is to apply for um, markets like IFP or uh, pitching, um, pitching sessions. Uh, Hot Docs has another great forum. Um, they also have a, a sort of speed dating um, piece to, to their, um, to their uh, program. So again, that is another way to make relationships. A realistic fundraising strategy. So, you know, I think they're the, the, the funders that we all know about, like Sundance um, or Chicken and Egg or Catapult or Fork Films. But, you know, we really want to see, and I think any fiscal sponsor will want to see, that you've really thought about the fundraising that is right for your project. If yours is an environmental film, have you researched environmental organizations that are funding film? Or if your project um, is centered in a, a specific place where you have a lot of really strong relationships, you know, do you have a fundraising strategy that's going to take advantage of local businesses that may want to support your project? So really don't just think about um, the, the kind of big film funders, think about the funders that are really specific to your project. Um, research, 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 yes. So Foundation Center um, is a great resource. IDA is also a great resource. IDA actually has um, a, a resource on their website that is a spreadsheet of uh, grants that is fantastic. I go there, I go there all the time when I'm advising filmmakers in our production assistance program. I highly recommend spending some time on the IDA website. Um, you know, this is really important too. Read the guidelines because not every project is right for every funder. Um, and so you really want to make sure that your project um, is meeting uh, the guidelines for a specific funder. Because again, even if you don't get it, if your project um, had a pretty good shot, then they're getting to know it. And if they see it again the following cycle and they see that it has um, evolved, it might put it in, uh, it might give it a better shot. Okay, so here are some funding resources. Um, again, if you go to the Women Make Movies website, you'll see a film funders list. Um, we have a lot of different grant funders on there. Uh, we are also offering right now um, free webinars. So if you go to our website, you will be able to register for a selection of our past webinars. This is something that we um, started in light of COVID as a way to offer filmmakers some resources to just help them, you know, feel productive during this time, give them information during this time. 
Um, and those uh, webinars run the gamut from meet the industry to meet the funder, to proposal writing, budgeting. Um, so I, I highly recommend um, registering for those. As I said, the IDA grants directory, it's fantastic. Um, there's also a website called Film, Film Daily that has a grant list. Um, and this, this is really just a list of some of the foundations that uh, accept the core application. And you know, the core application uh, was created to make fundraising easier for filmmakers. So this is why so, so many of them um, accept this application. Um, and so I just wanted to let you all know that um, we have some upcoming webinars. Some of our webinars are free, some of them are not. Um, these two are not, um, but we did reduce the price again because we understand how hard it is right now for filmmakers who um, have lost a lot of their income. So we have uh, reduced the prices across the board, but as you can see from this slide, we would also love to offer this discount code um, to anybody who is watching right now. Um, feel free to go to our website and register um, and this discount code will be good for any future webinars as well. And I believe that that is it. So I will stop sharing now and um, open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, that was a really rich archive of information. And um, we have one quick uh, clarification question. Um, would you mind just going over um, IDA, what that is, what it stands for? Sure. It's the International Documentary Association. So they have a fiscal sponsorship program, but they also um, administer a couple of different grants. They have the Pere Lorenz grant. Um, and right now the, um, the theme, I guess you would call it for this year is criminal justice. So that's their focus and that those are the projects that they're looking for um, right now. But they also have the Enterprise Fund. And the Enterprise Fund is for projects that uh, have some sort of um, journalistic uh, underpinning um, or, or uh, journalistic intent behind them. And that is for development and production. But mm -hmm. again, they're also just a great resource. They have tons of things on their website um, to help filmmakers. Thank you. And I really appreciate you sharing all these links. Um, and. I'll, I might, is there a way we could um, you have access to your PowerPoint so folks would be able to? I'm, I'm happy to send that to you. Okay, yep. thank you, thank you. Yep. So we'll make that available. Um, and we did have one question that came in before um, you joined us. Uh, someone was asking, so you did provide us a wealth of resources for different types of funding. Um, it's sometimes hard to ask for money and someone brought up that, um, asking for advice on raising films, especially during this time of COVID-19, um, when it can be really uncomfortable actually to ask for donations given the state of the economy. So what would you tell this person? Hmm, well, that's really hard. And, and I don't think there's any one answer. Um, one thing that, um, that I, I think is kind of a really wonderful idea um, that I've heard from uh, some of my colleagues who have talked to some of their filmmakers um, and what their filmmakers are doing are putting together these sort of uh, Zoom check-ins with their supporters. Um, and it's not to ask for money necessarily, but it's to stay connected and to let their supporters know that the project is continuing even right now um, in, what, well, in whatever way it can, whether that is working on the proposal, whether that is editing, um, wh whatever it is. And that, that's a, sort of a way, I guess, to ask for funding, but not really ask, to, to maybe open up um, a dialogue with your supporters and connect with them and, and hope that they ask, how can we help? And then you say, well, we need funding for X, Y, and Z. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't have one perfect answer, unfortunately. It's hard, I know it's hard. Um, I think, uh, you know, even before all this started, I actually think, um, particularly if you have a fiscal sponsor, um, newsletters are a really great way to ask for money. You know, 
making sure that you have a list of emails of your supporters, keeping, keeping that up to date, and just twice a year or quarterly, sending out a newsletter. Here's some new information about the project. We just got this grant, or we just did this great interview, or we need to go on this shoot, or we need to do this. And then at the bottom, a donate button. So for example, projects in our program have their own page, have their own project page, and they can include a button in where, you know, wherever, their website or their newsletter that will link directly to their project page so that people can make donations online. That's another kind of good way to ask for money. Again, you're, you're giving information, you're giving updates. Um, and then just at the very end, if people can support you, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I appreciate this emphasizes what you had mentioned during your presentation about the importance of building relationships. So not, um, not everything necessarily needs to involve asking for money, but just sort of making those connections can be really important. Yes. Um, so something that you had mentioned, um, you, you said you gave the number $350,000 at one point when talking about when you might, uh, women make movies stops taking um, percentage of the, um, yes. of what people bring in, yes. which is a, a huge budget. A lot of uh, the people who might be watching this may be first time filmmakers or be making small films. And so could you just talk more about um, how to approach this? Uh, maybe if you're not making a feature length film or maybe you're making an experimental um, film or. I, you know what, you froze for just a minute there. I'm sure. so sorry. Can you can you ans ask the question again? Sure. Um, so for someone who might be working with a much smaller budget yeah. or might be working on an experimental film or someone who's yep. a first time filmmaker, how would you advise them in this process? Sure, okay. So um, the first thing that I would say is make sure that your budget includes everything. And we all know that um, you know, filmmakers will make the film for whatever they can. So you know, you'll have your ideal budget and then the, you know, okay, we can pay people budget. And then the, we're scraping it together and we're gonna get it made budget. Um, but the budget that you put together that you send out to funders should always include your own salary, your producer's salary, everybody else's salary. And if they have um, offered in-kind services or deferred salary, you can include that um, in, in a line in your budget. So it's very clear that your budget may be 350,000, but you're getting 100,000 in in-kind services or deferred. Um, but you want all of that in there because a, you want a funder to know that you know how much everything should cost. Um, but also, if they fund you, you should get paid. Um, and you should be able to pay everyone else. And so it needs to be in your budget in order to be able to use that money to do it. Um, you know, and uh, we, one of our webinars, one of our free webinars um, is a fantastic budgeting webinar that really breaks down, because this is very difficult and it is not my area of expertise and filmmakers have a lot of questions on it. Um, so I would encourage you to look at that webinar, um, but also going back to IDA, I believe they have some sample budgets on their website at, at different um, levels. Um. And so we have just a few more minutes. So I thought I would try to combine two questions. Um, one, just if you were gonna offer maybe three kind of tips around best practices or things that you would recommend every filmmaker do when pursuing fiscal sponsorship, what might they be? And then are there any drawbacks to fiscal sponsorship? Um, when would someone maybe not wanna pursue something like that? Um, okay, well, uh, uh, one, one tip, I, I would give is make sure that you have a good accounting system in place, no matter what your budget is. If you're keeping an Excel spreadsheet, great. If you're using QuickBooks, fine. But make sure that you are keeping every receipt and that you are keeping tra track of every dollar. Um, different fiscal sponsors have different ways of um, making sure that money is spent appropriately. Um, 
Our way is an audit system. So we have outside auditors who come in and will ask for, and we'll just choose projects. We'll just select projects. Um, and those projects will have to uh, turn in invoices and their general ledger. So having a good accounting system is so important. Um, let's see, uh, another tip for best practices. Um, you know, make sure you're ready. Uh, so make sure you have a work sample, make sure you have a good proposal, make sure that, you know, you have identified a fundraising plan that makes sense for fiscal sponsorship. Um, in terms of drawbacks, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that there's a drawback. I, I think it's more, do you need it? Because if you don't need it, then why have it? Um, again, for example, if you are, if you're going to raise your budget through a crowdfunding campaign, you just don't need it. Like we have an annual fee of $35 and we have reporting requirements. Well, why are you gonna put yourself through that if you don't need it? Um, you know, some other fiscal sponsors require you to be a member of their organization. And if there's no other reason that you are a member of their organization other than uh, the fiscal sponsorship and you don't need it, why are you paying the membership fee? You know, so I think, I think it's more about um, the, the, the not so much drawbacks, but do you need it? And really thinking about that. Yes, that makes sense. I feel like sometimes it can be attractive to pursue something because it's an option or you might have a strong case to make, but it can also add a lot of extra labor that you might not want to invest in. Um, uh, so thank you, Barbara. Um, I think we'll transition to our next speaker, but I really can't express how grateful I am for sharing all of this wisdom and insight with us. Um, and thank you also for leaving your contact information with us. So people, I assume, yes. are welcome to reach out if they have questions. Oh my gosh, yes. A absolutely. Please, anybody can reach out and um, I will send you the PowerPoint. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I look forward to our next conversation. Absolutely. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Agatha. I am going to bring on our next guest who is here. Hi, Christina. Good to see you. Um, give me one second as I transition. Um, awesome. Okay. Give a little background about Christina. Christina uh, Rea is a New York City-based writer slash director and founder of Majestic Cat Productions. She focuses on character-driven narrative projects that explore social issues through humor and horror. Her work consisting of over a dozen short films, a web series, and two feature films has screened at film festivals around the world and gained a large online following through multiple crowdfunding campaigns and coverage on press outlets such as IndieWire and BuzzFeed. Through a desire to support other filmmakers, she works for Seed and Spark as a head of education, teaching and empowering creators to build their audience and crowdfund their work. She also runs IndieWorks, a monthly screening community building series showcasing short films by other New York filmmakers. You can find her at crea9 on Instagram. So thank you, Christina, for being here. Always being amazing. Of course. Um, I guess to get started, I wanted to ask if you, we had a great conversation with Women Make Movies, Barbara sharing resources about budgeting, but are there any other additional resources that you can share for independent filmmakers, being a filmmaker yourself, anything that you found valuable for budgeting? Yeah, when it comes to budgeting, I like to work backwards. So I will usually try and watch some independent films that feel like they're at the budget level that I'm looking to make a film at. And I will then actually reach out to the filmmaker and see if I can look at their budget breakdown. Uh, mm -hmm. Not always do I get a yes, but sometimes I do. And it's really educational in a way that I think you don't quite get from just the, the general templates that you can download off the internet. Mm -hmm. Seeing like where people had to cut things, where they, ha where they maybe had like a line item that, that ended up 
being way more than they estimated for or way or they just like had to cut it all together and find some sort of other uh, resource that has really helped me in making the really, really micro budget films that I make. Um, and similarly, I try to share my budgets as well with people so they can see also like where I'm getting in kind versus actually spending cash because I think that's the the hard thing to really figure out when you're when you're putting together a budget breakdown is like what what could I theoretically get in kind and what do I really absolutely have to spend cash on and and like the little things that you may not anticipate yeah yeah um Following up on that, then how do you, how proactive, I, proactive, I guess, should filmmakers be when strategizing their budget and trying to find whether they're going to go for grants, go for crowdfunding, do in-kind, how far ahead should we be thinking about these things, like in the development phase, or is it going to progress? Yeah. I think, you know, it depends on what hats you wear in in production. Like if you're wearing many hats, then you may need to just focus on the creative side for, for a while in the early stages of development and then transition into budgeting. But um, I think that you should always be thinking about any film you plan to produce as starting a small business. Um, and so having kind of like a business plan or strategy in place and especially thinking about what you're going to do with it like what is the life cycle of it and what is the end result because you don't want your movies to just exist in a vacuum you want them to get seen you want them to have a life to them and so thinking about like what is this really going to cost me from beginning to end will help you figure out not only what your overall budget needs to be but also where and at what stages you might have to explore different kinds of funding. Like if you know that you're going to have to crowdfund at some point because you have this overall total and you can only raise this through grants and through investors, um, then you can kind of make really strategic decisions about at what stage do you actually want to crowdfund? When does it feel the most feasible for you from like a bandwidth perspective, but also from having like a team in place and having something to show already like progress on the thing. So I think really having that set before you dive into fundraising in general will help you. Got you. Um, and then we've kind of talked about this with the rest of our guests, but with the, with the events of today with COVID, um, crowdfunding might be not taboo, but very sensitive right now and trying to seek funding from others. So I guess, how are you, how are you um, giving advice for filmmakers if they're trying to go through that route and seeking funds? Yeah, so I don't think that there is one right answer for every film and every filmmaker. I think it really starts with your audience and, and talking to them. And so something that we've been advising people to do is just doing like a check-in on how they are from a financial perspective, from just like a mental health perspective, how are they doing your specific audience? And so before you even like dive into that, you need to actually figure out who your audience is and we, like, we teach workshops on that, on how to figure out who your audience is. But once you have a pool of people, it's like doing check-ins and really running it by them. Like we had this one campaign that um, called Swoon Town. It's a, it's a really lovely queer inclusive project. And the filmmakers were going to just like not launch their campaign because they had planned on going live. It just ended, I think, two days ago. So they had planned to go live um, around the same time that they ended up going live. I think they only pushed it by a couple weeks. Uh, but they were like, should I? It doesn't, I don't know if I should. I, I'm kind of uncomfortable with asking people for money right now. And if they do have any spare change, they probably should be giving it to really necessary resources to deal with the, the pandemic. Um, but they also felt like they had a really timely story that mattered and that would give people hope and something to look forward to and be like a creative distraction and, and inspiration hopefully and so they just kind of reached out to their audience and they were like do you think that how would you feel if we launched our campaign do you think that you know giving 25 dollars would 
would hurt you or would you appreciate what we're offering you at that level and just being part of this project and they found that uh, people were really enthusiastic about it because I think that while yes it's really important to be sensitive to how just horrific of a time we're living in right now is um, it's also important to remember that people need things that energize them to keep going. And that's something that we as storytellers have to offer. And if you think about like what people are turning to right now in this in this time and be staying in, it's movies, it's watching movies, watching TV. And, and so I think that the best thing that we can do is find ways to keep telling stories. Um, and so just doing that sensitively and that campaign Spoontown actually raised 130% of their goal. Um, Wow. So, so it, it can, it can work out for you still. It's just really acknowledging the reality and working with your audience. Yeah. Yeah. Having that sensitivity first, of course. Yeah. Um, awesome. Um, so next question. Um, what are some of the common mistakes or pitfalls you notice filmmakers making um, when they do develop a budget or even start a campaign on Seed and Spark? What are some mistakes? So on the budget side, I think the biggest mistake that we see, especially from first-time filmmakers, is not putting themselves in the conditions that they'll be filming the film in. So like mm -hmm. my very first feature was shot in Massachusetts in January in mm -hmm. snow and a lot of negative degree weather. It was really intense. I'll never do it again. Um, but it, it was it was it was really grueling just like outside of the fact that we were working long hours and a movie set in and of itself can be exhausting but also the cold and just like shivering and being stiff the whole time and like eating a lot more food just to sort of keep yourself going and trying to stay warm all of that were those were things that i didn't necessarily budget for properly um and i was a first time director and so that was a learning experience for me and I, in hindsight i realized i should have worked on a set for someone else in those conditions so that I could see like what I needed that I wasn't getting from production mm -hmm. and and I, I think I would have been a much better producer had I done that uh, at that particular time this was eight years ago um but uh yeah so I think that that's something that you definitely want to think about is like what you know what's the weather going to be like what are you what are you gonna have to budget for that maybe isn't in a typical film budget mm -hmm. that that will keep people warm or keep them cool or they're maybe they're going to eat more because it's colder or they're going to want just like specific things that are really specific to your conditions and so i think that's a huge mistake that people make mm -hmm. um and also just i would say food like not budgeting for, for food uh, and just that that's even if it's not cold and or even if it's not like there's a reason why people are overeating just in general people yeah. like crafty is the best thing you can spend money for to have a happy productive crew mm -hmm. um, and cast as well so mm -hmm. so yeah just make, make sure that you're feeding people well and that you've budgeted for like variety yeah especially if you're shooting consecutive days yeah <laughs> it would create a mutiny without good meals yes um with going back to seed and spark as far as building a campaign with you guys mm -hmm. what is um something you look for before you because you have a review process before you allow people to launch so what is that review process i guess so we we mainly look to see that you're prepared we that some people who have never crowdfunded before don't realize that it is a lot of work. And it is, what I like to think of it as is sort of like film production where you, the pre-production is really the work and, and then production is just executing on all of that, but it's really about how, how much you prepare in advance. And so that's what we're looking for when you submit for review to see that you have an understanding of who your audience is that you have an email list because emails are really everything when it comes to not only crowdfunding, and fundraising in general, but also like 
promotion, getting kind of real conversion rates from outreach to watching the movie or spreading the word or showing up to a screening. Um, it's really all about emails. So we want to see your email list. We want to make sure that that number of emails makes sense with your goal size, which is all kind of based on the averages that we've seen across the board at different goal levels. Um, and we also just look for a, a commitment to doing the outreach because some people think that like just posting on social media a few times is going to get people to discover their page and give them money and that's really not the case it is very much about the personalized why like why the individual person you're reaching out to should want to be a part of this yeah. particular project yeah. um, and that's really what we're looking for and then we also will look at your materials and give you feedback um, on like your pitch video, if we, we think that it could be a little bit tighter or it, it is missing, you know, a specific like call to action or something like that, we will just look at it and give you feedback. And that's, that's the thing that makes our platform really unique is that every project gets that. And it's why we have the 80% success rate that we do, which is twice any other platform. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, I have a question um from agatha actually uh she says or ask are there parts of the filmmaking process that you have um found make more funds than one expect maybe the producer or the director or the production team expects to make or you don't see any like strategy as far as building their platform or their following on seed and spark um so in terms of this stage is that like the, the the aspect of production is that the question yeah yeah um so as far as the stage i would say the earlier you can get people involved the better however you don't want to try and raise too early um before it's tangible so it's hard to raise for development um when it comes to audience it's like you can do that with grants you can do that maybe with investors depending on your past work and really like what you have to show it's hard to do that with audience funding which is what crowdfunding is because they have a lot of, yeah the goal is that you're not just reaching other filmmakers and you're not just reaching friends and family you're crowdfunding specifically through the people who really want to watch this movie and they may not and probably won't be filmmakers themselves. And so it's hard to like explain to them what development is, why it's taking so long, like where's the cast, you know, they, they want something really tangible. And so I say that it's, it's easier to crowdfund and you'll find more momentum when you've already cast and you've secured a lot of things like the pre-production stuff, like your locations and, um, and you have some things in place, like maybe you have some photos to show of your actors in wardrobe, like trying on things, or you have like tech scouts of your locations to show. That just adds this element of like in progress. And then what you can create is this urgency of like, we're all ready to go, but we can't do it without you joining us, without you yeah. making it possible. Yeah. Um, so that, I think that's kind of the best time to, to crowdfund. Also, um, right after you've wrapped production can, can be good for momentum if you need post-production funds. However, it does require then some like educating of your audience of why post-production costs money <laughs> because they may not actually know that. They might think like, well, you shot it. I see footage. So why do you need more money? It's done. And they don't get like, that sound mixing needs to happen and color grading and all of these other elements. Yeah, got you. Oh man, yeah, it's hard explaining. I don't know, people, many people watching live have to explain to family members like what you're doing for a living and like, I, yeah, yeah, just trust <laughs> me, support me, it's okay. Um, but I guess going back to budgeting and even personal, you know, experience for the work you've done, have you, how have you, I guess, strategized in the ways you went after grants and section off that in your budget and then the way you wanted to prioritize for crowdfunding? I guess, how did you layer that out? Uh, yeah, so grants for me are usually just like 
because they're not guaranteed, right? I don't really have any control there. I can put together the best application possible, but it's so much about what else is in the submission pool and, and other factors. And so I will usually treat them as like either to, to try first and then see what I get from there or try at the end for, for finishing funds because I find like that the actual production, getting that in the can, need, I need to know it can happen in a certain time and, and at a certain scale. And so I need to feel like I have those funds guaranteed. Um, and so usually I will apply for grants like really early, like when I've just written the script or I'm in very early development, I, I usually won't be pursuing grants once I've like either gotten a bunch of rejections or I've gotten the little bit that I have. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, it's, it, grants are competitive. It's really hard in the narrative space, which is where I work. So um, it, it can be very hard. Finishing funds are a little bit easier. So that's usually where I end up is applying for finishing funds. And that's where I've had a little bit of success. Um, so that's, that's always like, either at the very beginning, we'll give it a shot and see where we end up or at the very end when we know like what we need to finish it and we can, you know, pursue some other things and then maybe come back to crowdfunding because we know like exactly how much we need. Um, in terms of production, I crowdfunding is always a part of the production funding for me, especially for larger projects, because I find that even if I don't necessarily need the funds, which hasn't been the case because I do need the funds, but even if I don't necessarily need the funds through crowdfunding, um, it's just a great way to build momentum. Like you can take a successful campaign to investors and say, hey, look, there are 200 people who paid for this thing already. They want yeah. it, they're waiting for it. You should invest in it. Yeah. Um, and also you, it kind of like keeps you accountable. So you can commit to actually getting the thing done and by a certain time, because you have these people that are waiting on you and are excited and they, they feel a sense of, sort of sense of ownership because they helped make it. Yeah. And that keeps you motivated. Yeah. It keeps me motivated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yes, crowdfunding, I think, is so intimidating. I don't know how many for other filmmakers. For me, it's just as far as um, first understanding your scheduling for the whole thing and understanding how you are supposed to maintain um, your audience. So I guess what are your best practices for that as far as before you even begin your campaign how should one go into this type of uh, strategy for funding yeah yes it can be intimidating I totally get that and I I was intimidated before I started I had the sort of luxury I guess of I started crowdfunding in 2011 so it was very very new so there yeah. were the stakes to, to running a campaign and failing like weren't quite there the way that they are maybe now. Um, but I, what I think is great about crowdfunding is that you can do it in manageable amounts. So you can just like try a small campaign and see if it takes off and just say like, this is, you know, to hire our casting director or this is to hire our, like, this producer or something that is just very specific and tangible. And you can clearly tell people it's not going to make the final product. So you don't find yourself then beholden to like running more campaigns and just trying to raise the whole budget. Um, you can say like, this is for one specific thing and then see how it does, how you feel about it. How did it, how did it play for you as, as just like the outreach aspect. Um, but in terms of preparation, I like to think of crowdfunding as storytelling. And so really thinking about how, what you're doing is not additional work it's earlier work. It's all stuff that you're going to have to do for distribution, but you're doing it before the thing exists. Yeah. And really just think about like telling the story of the making of your film. That's what you're doing. And you're trying to get people engaged and excited about that. Yeah. And the asking for money is sort of secondary and comes later. And I have found, uh, often happens somewhat automatically once people are engaged. So it is really just about trying to build momentum. And, and that means like starting an email list. That's the first thing that you should definitely do if you haven't. Start building an email list. Maybe create a newsletter. I know that was said earlier. That's a great way to start like 
showing people that you're doing stuff and that there's more coming. Um, and then slowly start to just like see what's getting engagement, what, what are people clicking on, what are they responding to, who are my most engaged kind of likers and sharers of things, and start building them into preparation for a crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, it's very much like just it's audience building with yeah. fundraising secondary. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That sounds, I'm motivated. You motivated me to see it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess kind of in follow up, a lot of the maybe a lot of people watching, you know, today are doing one man, one woman shows. And so I guess is that is there a way to better manage your mental health and your uh, capacity of running this? by yourself or is it best to build a supportive team or I don't know how I've gone about doing projects? I think that crowdfunding needs to be collaborative the same way that filmmaking is, even if you are working on your own largely, I assume that you have someone, even if it's just like a sounding board. Mm -hmm. And so getting yourself that person in a crowdfunding campaign will be just as important um, because it is, it is, emotionally mentally taxing because you are doing a ton of outreach and to the the reality is that I would say you have about a 30 percent conversion rate so like you're doing this outreach and a lot of people are going to ignore you and that can be hard and a lot, a lot of people might say some people might, I've, I've never experienced anyone being like dismissive but I've definitely experienced people saying like I just don't have the money right now or sometimes you find yourself like being on the receiving end of, of someone sharing their hardships with you because you've reached out to them. And so now you have to be like this sounding board for someone else mm -hmm. when you're going through this really stressful, time sensitive thing. Yeah. Um, and so that like that takes a lot out of you. And so I would say that definitely creating um, some sort of environment that, that you can vent in um, and then if you can spread out the work even if it's like getting some interns on board who are maybe just working for credit like bigger credits than what they're actually doing that's that can be really helpful just like let them manage social media don't have that just like constantly coming at you yeah. and let them you know handle some deliverables if, if in terms of incentives and things like that so really just thinking about what you specifically need to be the one to handle and seeing where you can fill in gaps yeah. and also like time blocking. I find it really helpful to say like, I, this is the time that I'm going to just work on the campaign. And this is the time where I'm not going to even touch it or think about it or respond to notifications and, and just make sure that you're building in time every day during the campaign to give it attention, but that yeah. it's not just like constant because I know when I'm, when I'm on set, for instance, I turn off all notifications and I'm just like, I'm not paying attention to anything that's coming through my phone, but I don't necessarily always give myself that when I'm just like sitting on my couch watching a movie, I will still have like notifications coming to me and it snaps me back into this state of like work and pressure and well, it's like, why am I doing that to myself, you know? And yeah. so I think we should, we just, it's about like personal responsibility of saying, I know how I can be, at least for myself, like I know how I can be that if I see a notification, I'm going to want to respond to it. So I'm just going to turn it off and not allow myself that in this particular time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh good. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, Christina, is there anything you want to share as far as what C and Spark is doing right now or any works? Uh, yeah, so we're doing a bunch of free workshops. We have a crowdfunding workshop that's completely free. It's on June 3rd. Um, you can find it on our website, seedandspark.com slash events. You should definitely register for that if you're interested in crowdfunding. We've also been doing some distribution workshops, so you can find those listings on the event page as well. Um, and we've been recently doing uh, lunch and learns every Wednesday. So at 4 p.m. Eastern time, that's which is late for lunch, but it's it's made for <laughs> Pacific time, lunch time. Um, but uh, at 4 p.m. every Wednesday, we do a lunch and learn on a new topic. And it's usually small, like 
very manageable topics. So we did one on building an email list a few weeks ago that was really popular. And we did one on social media marketing and, um, and we're about to do one on audience building, like how to identify your audience that's in a few weeks. So I definitely recommend you tune into those. I think they'll be helpful, especially if you're just starting out the preparation for what will eventually be your fundraising campaign. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. This is awesome. Um, and I will be reaching out to you. I know we have some people that came to the festival and wanted the the decks that okay. you presented, uh, presentation decks. So I'll be reaching out to you. But thank you again for being no here, problem. taking time. Um, I guess, Agatha, if you want to come back on screen, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> still here, yes. <laughs> thank you, Christina. No problem. Um, as we wrap up, I just wanted to thank everybody on uh, Facebook, YouTube, whatever streaming service you're using right now. Thank you for joining us during this Finding Funds for Your Film live stream. Um, we're so grateful to our guests, Christina, Barbara, um, Erica, for taking time to be with us this afternoon, sharing their wisdom and their knowledge. Um, we hope that you found valuable information through this uh, live stream and you can stay connected with these organizations. We're going to be posting links to each of their websites on Facebook and making sure you are staying uh, involved in the work that they're doing. Um, and I hope you can stay involved with us, DBFF. We're continuing our summer session series and um, our programming, trying to unite the community virtually and create some space for networking and collaboration. And our next event will be June 11th with our virtual mixer for that month. So join us at 7 p.m. Um, and if you are not a part of our contact list, feel free to sign up, go to Denton, bff.com on the very front page. You can scroll down to the bottom and there is a link to sign up for our, subscribe, our subscription uh, list. So please make sure you do that if you're not a part of the DBFF family already. Um, again, I wanted to thank you on the behalf of DBFF um, and DBFF Institution, my lovely uh, assistant director, Agatha, um, again, Erica, Barbara, Christina, thank you again, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon, and we look forward to connecting with you later, so have a great day, have a great Wednesday, bye everybody.